so far. <coughs> There we go. Um, Space Kia, favorite LaTeX package. Um, I don't know. XY, which was the one I used, I used the most. That's not just a standard uh, everybody use package. All right, <clears throat> ten viewers. Can we uh, can we up the viewer rate? Ah, oh, geometry package. Yeah, I don't really. I mean, it's one of those things that's invisible because you know you sort of set the margins and it's really good, <clears throat> but then. No one notices it. All right. <clears throat> so I've got to finish off the calculation from last time, uh, namely, um, yeah, hang ten. Oh, come on. <sighs> Sorry, Tyson. Limited time left in the course. <laughs> You can always watch the live, the uh, the uh, the playback. All right, so we got to finish off this calculation. In particular, I sort of mentioned this. I just want a side sort of lemma. Will come in a bit more useful later. Namely, let's say we have a space that's uh, like a disjoint union of a bunch of spaces, arbitrary, um, x alpha, then we have all the restriction maps you know, like induced by the inclusions, and we have a stack of those, and so we get a map into the product. And it really is the direct product of rings here. It's not the direct sum. So it's not a direct sum. This is important. Uh, yeah, we have this map and it's an isomorphism. Even better, it's a natural isomorphism, but I haven't defined what natural is. So just assume it's compatible with everything you've ever seen. Um, and you can use this in the case where you have like a disjoint union of two things to figure out what the cohomology of the zero sphere is in terms of the cohomology of a single point. Okay, so that's that's a, a little important thing. But I want to um, <clears throat> sort of justify justify this bit here. So it was um, someone asked me privately on Discord about why I define the, the reduced cohomology in terms of a co-kernel instead of a terms of a kernel. And it turns out they're the same thing as long as both of them are defined. So uh, what did I have? So I claimed, so I had this, I calculated this from the long exact sequence, but suppose I want H0SN. And I'm not allowed to use any intuition about, well, I know it's connected, therefore blah, 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 because these modules are enormous. Um, <clears throat> and it's not like Durham cohomology where you go, oh, I know it's the constant functions. Okay, <clears throat> so here's, here's a thing. We know you have a, always have a map, a continuous map from, well, any space to a point. But I'm going to take the sphere here as an illustration. And since the n sphere is not the empty space, <coughs> so I'm going to call this exclamation mark. It's unique. And I say I pick a point 
in the sphere X and I'll just call the map which picks it out I'll call that X then um, so you can think of this also as being uh, well this is certainly the identity you know the point up to the sphere and back down you get the identity of the point and so we hit it with the, the H0 functor the regular H0 um, so this is like the H0 applied to exclamation mark and the co-kernel of this is what I define to be the uh, the reduced cohomology this is all singular here and <clears throat> I know this I know this and I know this I want to justify what h0 of sn is so I'm using an arbitrary ring here I've just suppressed it in the notation and you're not allowed to argue by sort of analogy with vector spaces arbitrary rings here it's highly not obvious to start with All right <clears throat> so but we also have this map the other way h0 of x if that makes sense um, with the property that right, it's a functor so I can see what happens with this equation this becomes um, that way then that way h0 x compose h0 exclamation mark everything singular here is the identity on h0 of a point so in particular we know that um, this tells us that this is a nice exercise h0 exclamation mark is injective this is just a general property when you have a pair of maps that satisfy this identity the this one here is injective it's a map of sets or map of a linear map of something okay we also know so there's a general result that says that this is also equal to so it's defined to be the co-kernel so that's on to this is also equal to the kernel of h0x for any choice of x yeah sorry Tommy <coughs> is it bad quality or is it just quiet um, <clears throat> okay but since h0 twiddle of sn is the zero module this implies that because it's a co-kernel this map here is onto and moreover since the kernel of h0 x equals 0 that means that h0 uh, x is injective but um, but in fact actually we don't need that bit yeah so oh it's injective it's onto it's a linear map of rings therefore it's a bijection that's linear therefore it's an isomorphism um, so h0 exclamation mark is a linear isomorphism um, and so H0 point which is R is isomorphic to H0 SN so <clears throat> just wanted to sort of illustrate this nice result again it's a nice exercise um, and it's true for general spaces not just their n sphere as long as your space is not empty um, but we had to do a sort of careful argument to make sure it wasn't like um, some weird quotient ring of R or something like that
because like if h0 point was z and h0 of sn was like z mod n then its co-kernel can still be zero um, so it's not automatic all right so sorry for the sniff um okay so now we have h0 we have hn so what about the other ones so we have to keep using this induction so let's fix l positive and let's consider uh, again with R coefficients uh, this um, so this is going to get us the cohomology modules um, the exclamation mark is always unique DMN because there's only one function to a single point and it's automatically continuous um, so maybe you're thinking X is uh, H0x is unique. X isn't unique, obviously, because it's a sphere. But up to possibly continuously moving that chosen point around, it's basically only one thing it can be. Yeah, this isomorphism, I shouldn't say it's equal, it's an isomorphism. Depends on choice of X. So now let's think about the cohomology groups above the dimension of the sphere. Um, by induction, you can then prove this is H twiddle L of S is zero. But, you know, <clears throat> this H twiddle well, even without the twiddle, HL of a point, direct sum HL of a point, which is zero. So the higher, these are the higher cohomology modules of a point, which we know how to calculate. Okay, now what about in the range what, um, between zero and N? So if N is one, there's nothing in between. So there's nothing to calculate. So now um, take in greater strictly greater than one and k between zero and n minus two so there's a slight oddness in the indexing here but you'll see how it goes so we get h twiddle k plus one of s n by induction is equal to h one so you do go down k steps uh, h one s n minus k um, and from our assumption, we know that n minus k is strictly greater than 1. So we want, so in general, can we calculate uh, h1 of sm for m greater than 1? Um, and then we should be done. So let's look at like the low end of the cohomology long exact sequence. Uh, let's say zero n, uh, let's say m minus one on the, the connecting homomorphism one s m goes to h one u h one v okay but u and v are both contractible so this side equals zero and <clears throat> m is greater than one so m minus one is greater than zero but we actually know this one already right h zero of h uh, so h twiddle zero of something positive uh, a positive dimensional sphere is also zero and so but this is exact and <coughs> well the image of delta is the same as the kernel of the next map but that's everything and so this forces h twiddle 1 sm 
which is the same thing as H1SM equal the zero module. And so we have all the cohomology modules of an arbitrary sphere. So to sum up, we have this HK of the N sphere. Okay, so it's R if k equals 0 or n, and 0 otherwise. So if you've ever, ever seen this stuff before, or anything vaguely related to this, you're not surprised. But we've done it from definitions, modulo, uh, some technical lemmas. Okay. So there we go. In particular, um, that SM is not homeotopy equivalent to SM for N not equal to M. So this is much less obvious because homotopy equivalence doesn't respect dimension and how on earth would you prove that you know like the 57 sphere and the 58 sphere are not homotopy equivalent all right it's i don't know how you do it except something like this and like your intuition is completely wrong in those in like high dimensional topology you know like what's that 28 different <clears throat> differentiable structures on the seven sphere I think dmn might be able to correct me if i'm wrong it's like what is, even does that mean um yeah uncountably different differentiable structures on r4 I mean, this is, you know, your intuition just fails you. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's, you know, that you might go, well, that's kind of not surprising. Here's a, so in particular, they're not homeomorphic because homeomorphism implies homotopy equivalence in a boring way. So here's an even more interesting one. And this is one that people thought about really hard at the beginning of the, of the def, of like, beginning of topology so you can prove that like r is not homeomorphic to r n for bigger n by using some argument about like cut points and disconnection and, and so forth but here's a much more serious uh, result possibly due to Brouwer so the problem is Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so so Neumann is talking about the differentiable structures work on spheres. Um, homeo. Iron is not homeomorphic to Rm for n and m different. Right. So Rn and Rm are homotopy equivalent. So that's kind of a uh, a silly, you know, that's not a question you, you, know, you could write that down instantly. It's not very interesting. <clears throat> However, how do you show they're not homeomorphic? Because this is not about uh, like squishiness up to homotopy, it's, it's more rigid. So we know that Rn and Rm are not linearly isomorphic, like they're not isomorphic as vector space. But what if you had like some weird non linear? non-differentiable map it's not obvious that there isn't such a thing there are many many continuous maps which are awful i mean there's a continuous ma uh, continuous surjection from r1 onto rn for every n
Oh, actually, is that true? Maybe I want to say something like <clears throat> maybe maybe I'll write this. So that's totally mind blowing. So that's why people were really worried about how do you even know that dimension is a topological invariant. So, here we can prove it. Um, <clears throat> well, if Rn is homeomorphic to Rm, then you can arrange it to such a way that 0, let's call it Psi, Psi is a funny looking letter. To write it a lot in physics, not so much now. Um, so, without loss of generality, assume psi of zero equals zero, takes the origin to the origin. And since it's a bijection, it remains a bijection on removing a single point from the domain and the codomain, and it remains a homeomorphism. Um, okay, so now let's look at the cohomology of these things. If these are homeomorphic, then their cohomologies should be the same. Um, it's just Z here, say. But we know that Rn minus a point is homotopy equivalent to uh, a sphere. So this is isomorphic to Sn minus 1. And this is isomorphic to the kth cohomology of Sm minus 1. So now let's take k equals n minus 1. So that implies that hk Sm minus 1 is isomorphic to, uh, well, say z. And let's see, I probably want to say something about the dimensions here. R has to be at least, N has to be at least one. It's very easy to show it's not possible for N equals zero because there's no bijections. I mean, Rn and Rm have the same cardinality. So it's not ruled out on cardinality grounds. Um, and so well, this is greater than or equal to 1 so k here is greater than or equal to 0 and so uh, this forces well the only possibilities here for m yeah I mean I'm, I'm doing that uh, DMN, but I'm just worrying about the fact that there's two cases. So certainly either k equals zero um, Let's let's take k take uh, N greater than or equal to two so k is greater than or equal to one and that implies that m minus one equals k Equals n minus one so n equals m, and we're done. <clears throat> so now what happens if uh, n equals 1? Now, um, then I can look at actually just k equals 0. 
Yep. Okay, equals zero. And then I have Sorry, I'm trying to do this off the top of my head here. Oh no, so if n equals 1, now we take k equal to m minus 1. Uh, and if If m is strictly bigger than 1, we run into trouble. I'll leave it as an exercise to uh, yeah, because if n equals 1, we get uh, s0, <clears throat> and then if m is too big, um, oh no, it will work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Sorry. I'm. Yeah. H zero of S zero turns out to be R plus R. And if M is bigger than one, then H zero S M minus one is R. Okay. So we need m equals 1 also. Alright. Cool. So this is sometimes known as invariance of, dim of dimension... Uh, of domain. Sorry. Invariance of domain. And that's kind of a hard theorem without cohomology. I'm not sure it was proved without cohomology without cohomology at all. It was kind of a big thing. Okay. Any questions? Half an hour in. <coughs> Comments? Come back, come back. All good. Well, okay, one person's all good. <clears throat> so another thing, there's just so many uh, techniques in this course, and I'm sorry, but there's just uh, there's just how many there are. Um, all right, so. So we do have, so there's all these variants of cohomology, and one thing I don't think I've defined is relative cohomology. Oh yes I did, relative singular cohomology. No, no I haven't. So, um, I yeah, yep, 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 yep. All right, yeah. So, I like um, relative cohomology for um, delta sets. We do this trick where we have. Um, not quite a short exact sequence of maps of cochain complexes, but we complete it up to one, and then we get some new cohomology. So, uh, so let's let X and A be a pair of topological spaces. So A sits inside X, subspace topology, 
Um, so then we have uh, the singular thing from X and then we can pull back along the inclusion map so think of not just as sitting inside but there's the actual map A sitting inside ah oh, it's not a star so I pull back this turns out to be onto because you can always extend things by zero anything that doesn't neatly sit inside a any like simplex in x that doesn't sit inside a you can evaluate a function to be zero on it so this is subjective and you look at its kernel and you define the kernel here to be the relative singular cochain complex then the uh, relative singular of this pair is this cohomology okay and it's functorial continuous maps of pairs contravariantly um, so x a to y b so it's a map such that f of a is contained inside b so it induces maps in the other direction I should say what this is it's h n singular x a r to get uh, n oh, it's a y yeah, star okay now you might ask what sort of such maps of pairs do we have well there's always a map of pairs that crushes everything in a down to a point so i have to sort of say what that is <clears throat> so if i have a space let's say i have a disk right <clears throat> draw it as a disk and then I have its boundary so that's a that's a nice pair the boundary of the disk well it's the n minus one sphere and I have a map from here to the n sphere so the same dimension that maps everything sort of inside the disk up onto the sphere and such that the see the north pole it sits inside here this sits inside here and this uh yeah that's the north pole there <clears throat> so this can and and this this process is continuous and the topology on like the final topology on the n sphere is the same as like the normal topology but it's also inherited like along this this squashing map um, so the standard topology on SN let's call this map Q <clears throat> so like 
a set containing n is open if you look at its pre-image under q so that's a set that contains the boundary if that's open and otherwise like away from the boundary q is injective wait away from the boundary actually even better q is a bijection in fact it's a homeomorphism Uh, well, it's because the boundary is closed. So let's say Q is a bijection, and in nice cases like this one, it's a, even a homeomorphism. Since um, this is closed, say so away from the boundary, Q is. So somehow this process, it, it takes a space and maybe quotients by some equivalence relation and puts a new topology on it such that, well, it doesn't take a space. It takes a pair, right? It takes the X and an A. And this is my X, and this is my A. And I think of this as my Y and this as my B. Um, it takes x a, scrunches everything in a down, puts a new topology on it, and then away from a, it doesn't mess with the topology too much. So, as a general idea, and this is I'm going to link um, like relative cohomology and ordinary cohomology in this way. So, well, near enough. So the general idea is given a pair x a, we can define a new space with x quotient a. What is this? So as an underlying set, it's x divided by the equivalence relation a1 is equivalent to A2 for all A in the subset A, subspace A. That's its underlying set. And there's a function. And it sends every point, well, it sends x to x, x, x is not in A, A goes to, well, the new point, like all the point, all the, all the things in A are scrunched down to a single point. And did I have a notation for that? I need to see. Maybe I'll call it star. And we give x mod a the final topology. Let's call this q sub a. Final topology with respect to uh, q sub a. So a set in x mod a is open precisely when its image up in x is open. And if this set doesn't contain my new special point star, then it's just an open set in X. Yeah, so this is sometimes called the quotient topology. I mean, you can put the quotient topology on anything that's been quotiented by an equivalence relation. But so all the X, XA is like the quotient space. So it's not like, you know, a quotient group or a quotient vector space where it's like in a ve quotient vector space, like every affine space parallel to your subspace is squashed down. Here it's like 
just take the subspace, crush that, and everything else stays where it is. So um, it's a highly nonlinear process. So note x mod a has a canonical base point. I'll call star and we get a map of pairs continuous map of pairs pairs x a to x mod a point okay so this is interesting because as we saw like reduced cohomology could be defined not just in terms of the co-kernel like I first gave it uh, I'll talk about that later Chris they're happening So the fact is, there's an isomorphism, iso, um, <coughs> between reduced cohomology of a space and relative cohomology of a space. So we saw a um, example of this in the sort of delta set world. And so when we look at this um, <clears throat> what does this map of pairs do? We get a map on relative cohomology from um, and using using this isomorphism, yeah, reduced cohomology x to R. Uh, sorry, no, that's not what I want. You take x mod a and take its reduced cohomology, maps back up to everything singular, maps back up to the relative cohomology. And in nice circumstances, this is an isomorphism. So what's the hypothesis? <coughs> um, where is it? All right. Maybe I'll just I'll just mention it. <clears throat> no. Um, I'll just say in nice cases, so a closed plus a bit more. I'll write this out in full detail in the notes. I'll just give you a flavour of it. This map is an isomorphism uh, for all k for all n. Uh, so, so yeah. <clears throat> so why do we care about this? 
because we uh, shrink a little bit how was the singular relative cohomology defined it's defined via a short exact sequence of cochain complexes and anytime we have a short exact sequence of cochain complexes we get a long exact sequence in cohomology but <clears throat> If we can identify this relative cohomology, if we can identify this relative cohomology with the ordinary cohomology of a quotient, then if we know that we have a space defined as a quotient, then we can sort of run the argument backwards and define and calculate using a long exact sequence involving the sort of unquotiented thing. We actually even get another long exact sequence that can calculate the cohomology of, of spheres this way. Um, <clears throat> so let me put a, whoops, that's not a, let me put a big one next to this. So important. Short exact sequence gives a long exact sequence involving this relative cohomology. Um, <clears throat> All right, that's what I want to say. Um, yeah, knew it. That's uh, something I've seen before. Um, all right. We can even do the Brouwer fixed point theorem. These are kind of little fun applications. Um, we have time to do that. It's another application. Does someone look up if invariance of domain was proved by Brouwer first? So here's the theorem. <clears throat> no endomorphism. Ah, uh, Lorray. Interesting. Tully. No endomorphism. F from dn to dn is free. So what does that mean? Free means that um, <coughs> f of x is not equal to x for points in the in the domain. Ah, interesting. Fixed point theorem. Mm. So, yeah, I mean they're clearly closely related because um, this proof uses the boundary of dn. Um, okay, so let's define. So let's we've got f, and what we're going to do is define g sub f from the disk to the boundary oh there's a picture uh, one can draw 
So you draw the picture and then uh, maybe you want to write down some kind of formula and then prove it's continuous. So this is uh, a good exercise in topology, but otherwise it's well defined. So if this is x is g of, uh, f of x, so you draw a line from x to f of x and then and keep going where that line hits the boundary, that's g f of x. That's a straight line. Um, so we are assuming uh, f is free. So then, um, <clears throat> oh, what do you do? Um, so g f is continuous by a sequential argument. So if x n goes to x, you can show. Well, f is continuous, so f well f x n converges to f of x and then we can show g sub f of x n converges to g sub f of x I mean there's a little bit of work there <clears throat> so then um, so if um, actually which way do I go did I go the wrong way ah uh, should be the other way from f of x to x let's just swap these ooh I can't that's uh, this is x this is f of x it matters um, okay and so note that if x is in the boundary then g f of x is in the boundary and so um, all right, what does that mean? So I want to think of the boundary as being included into dn and then I map back to the boundary and this composite is the identity it's g sub f and this is like the inclusion <clears throat> now we apply uh, the functor I suppose we want um, n is going to be greater than or equal to 1 so we apply the functor uh, h n minus 1 say z so we get a diagram going the other way so and the, the boundary is the n minus 1 sphere so this is n minus 1 s n minus 1 z which is now is equal to z we know dn is contractible so this is h n minus 1 dn z but that's equal to 0 and we have h n minus 1 s n minus 1 z so this map is i star this is gf star and that's equal to z and this map is the identity it's like h n minus 1 of the identity but because it's a functor it's, it's the identity on the cohomology and so but this implies that the zero map Z n going to zero is equal to identity of z, which is absurd. So uh, f uh, can't satisfy f of x 
equals x, uh, not equals x everywhere. Um, yeah, and so f can't be free. Not some weird double negation happening there. Okay. So this means that f has to have a fixed point somewhere. Sorry, that's the end of the proof, but the corollary is f needs to have a fixed point somewhere. We don't know where. I mean, f of x not equal to x has to fail at least once. Uh, GF is well defined. Um, <clears throat> Uh, let's see, so <clears throat> yeah, we were assuming that f was free. So if f is free, then gf is well defined. But then we become a cropper, and so what was the assumption? Right, The assumption was f was free. So for a real world f, not in the hypothetical world, you can't define such a function gf because um, this this procedure doesn't work because at some point you know where do you send um, where do you send x because f of x and x have to coincide and so there's no line you can draw anyway so that's that's two uh, well three I suppose sizable applications SM and SN are not homotopy equivalent when N and M are different. RN and RM are not homeomorphic when N and M are different. And every map from DN to DN, continuous map from DN to DN, can't be free. So it's got some it's got some fixed point somewhere. Um, so these are just problems in topology. I mean the one about the spheres is probably a sort of a homotopy theoretic, but the, the, the invariance of domain and the Brouwer fixed point theorems, the statements don't refer to algebraic topology or to homotopy at all. They're just purely like about continuity. Um, but their proofs use algebraic topology in a really neat way, and it just follows from the fact you have a functor. Okay, cool. Um, with that, we've hit the hour mark, so we have to uh, stop here, gear up for big two-hour block tomorrow, and then a tutorial on Friday, and hopefully more people can come to the tutorial because um, we don't get, uh, yeah, it's, it's better to have some breakout rooms so people can work in small groups rather than a one medium group. Um, so I encourage you all to get there. Um, I'll get out <coughs> something we can work on less vague this week. Um, yeah, but anyway, thanks for coming. I'll catch you all uh, shortly, and I'll get your assignments marked as soon as I can. Um, and good luck on the next one. Catch you later.